Okay, der Saal ist voll. Herzlich willkommen in der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung. Dass wir heute so viele sind, hat sicher sowohl mit dem Thema zu tun, über das wir heute Abend sprechen, wie mit den Personen, die hier auf dem Podium versammelt sind. Aber bevor ich eine kurze Vorstellung mache und ähm, in das Thema einführe, würde ich gerne sagen, dass George Soros darum gebeten hat, dass wir hier auf dem Podium Englisch sprechen. Es gibt aber eine simultane Übersetzung für alle, die sie in Anspruch nehmen wollen, ähm, können die Veranstaltung auch in Deutsch verfolgen. So I'll now switch uh, into English. No, 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 I, I, it's okay. It's, I, I'll try my best. I'll try my best. Um, I guess more or less all of us feel that there is something important going on in these days in, in Europe. Something that will change fundamentally the, the political landscape in our continent and maybe beyond. We have seen bloodshed at the Maidan, which could not stop a people uprising in Ukraine. President Yanukovych fled the country. A new government was established and a new majority in parliament is in place. But then the empire stroked back. We saw a heavy counter-strike by Russia's leadership, encouraging a Russian separatist movement in the Crimea, backed by military intervention and finally the annexation of the peninsula in a high-speed maneuver. I would say, uh, in a technical sense, perfectly engineered. And now we are facing maybe the most dangerous political crisis since the end of the Cold War in Europe. Russia and the West are back in a constellation of conflict, although the European Union and especially the German government are trying to contain the dynamics of confrontation. Yet there is an immediate threat of a new geopolitical political divide of Europe and the Ukraine is at the brink of political destabilization and economic disaster. The threat of a second Russian invasion into Ukrainian heartlands is far from over. Some of our friends in Ukraine are even afraid of a second Yugoslav scenario. So there are plenty of reasons to rethink German, European, Eastern policy and our strategy toward Russia. And the need to support Ukraine on her way to democratization, rule of law, institutional reform, economic modernization and defending its territorial integrity. All three of our guests are very distinguished, experienced and thoughtful thinkers on these uh, issues. I don't think it's necessary to introduce them briefly. Of course not Joschka Fischer, whom you all know from his former life, his long career as the informal but de facto political leader of the Greens and foreign minister during the Red Green government. Rebecca Harms, member of the European Parliament since 2004, where she is the president of the Green Group and the, in the Parliament and now frontrunner for the Green Party in the election campaign for the European, for the European Parliament in May. And she 
is really since, I don't know, Rebecca, 20 years or so, very, very dedicated when it comes to Ukraine. Frequent visitor there, she has a lot of friends there, a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. So I'm glad that you are here. And last not least, George Thoros. You all know him as one of the most successful business magnates and investors. But this is not the reason because he is here tonight. Um, George Soros at the same time is a philanthropist, very much engaged in promoting democracy, human rights, rule of law in Eastern Europe. He founded the Open Society Foundation, formerly the Open Society Institute, as uh, a main instrument uh, in promoting nonviolent democratization of post Soviet states in Central Eastern Europe. And he's founder of the Renaissance, uh, Renaissance Foundation, which is one of the most important political foundations in Ukraine. So he is also long term. Uh, engaged in the uh, topics we are talking about tonight. And I would like uh, to give George uh, Soros the, the opportunity uh, to start. He just released a book. Um, I think it was introduced yesterday uh, in Berlin, Betting on Europe why Germany must save the euro in order to save herself. Um, and I think it would be appropriate that you start with some thoughts on this book and then um, move to the, the topics of tonight, uh, the, the developments in Eastern Europe and the uh, challenges for the European Union. Please, Joshua. In my book, uh, I said uh, that uh, the. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So, uh, in, in my book, uh, I said that the acute acute phase of the euro crisis is over. Uh, uh, the euro is here to stay, <coughs> but. The euro crisis has uh, transformed the European Union from what it was originally intended, uh, namely uh, a voluntary association of equal and sovereign states uh, that uh, sacrificed or, so, uh, part of their sovereignty for the common good into something radically different, namely uh, a creditor debtor relationship where the debtors have difficulties in uh, meeting their obligations and that has put the creditors in charge. And so you, you, you have a, 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 an association that's neither voluntary nor, nor equal. Uh, and that is creating a political uh, problem. So from now on, you can expect a series of f uh, political crises uh, rather than financial ones. And uh, no sooner was the book published, but you have the first one and the most serious one in Ukraine. Um, uh, and I think that's actually uh, a, uh, a, th a, th a threat to the European Union but it's also a tremendous opportunity to, f for Europe to recapture the original impetus, which, because it was always a political project, and it's, it's uh, now uh, needed more than ever. And, and uh, it's also an, an opportunity uh, for, for Chancellor Merkel to uh, uh, emerge 
as uh, the leader of a united Europe, not uh, just a, a, a chancellor preoccupied with the national interests of, of, of Germany. Um, now, um, when you look at the situation, uh, let me just make uh, uh, two, two points, one about uh, Russia and one about uh, Ukraine. Um, Putin, I think, uh, is acting out of weakness. He was quite, quite popular in, in uh, Russia until the transfer of power, the prearranged transfer of power uh, uh, from uh, Medvedev to Putin. Uh, that upset uh, the Russian public and he lost popularity. And that uh, uh, turned him adventurous ab abroad and repressive at home, out of weakness. That's when uh, um, Russia uh, became very involved in the Syrian crisis uh, and started uh, uh, providing armaments on a very large scale uh, to uh, uh, Assad. And that adventure actually uh, uh, turned into a diplomatic victory for him because uh, uh, when uh, uh, President Obama uh, um, turned to Congress and looked for endorsement for um, imposing sanctions, he was about to lose and uh, Putin could actually save him by, uh, by vo uh, persuading uh, Assad to voluntarily surrender the chemical weapons. That was a, a, an adventure that uh, paid off. And then uh, 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 he, in Ukraine also, uh, had no difficulty in outmaneuvering uh, the European Union that was uh, preoccupied with its internal uh, uh, problems and was not in a position to offer uh, very much uh, to Ukraine and demanded a lot, uh, namely the release of Yulia uh, Timoshenko, which would have been a, a big threat for Yanukovych, uh, and offered very little. So he had, uh, Putin had no difficulty in outbidding uh, and outmaneuvering uh, the European Union. And then something happened that, that uh, uh, neither side uh, expected, a spontaneous rejection of that deal by the Ukrainian people. And then, and that touched off a, uh, the Achilles heel of, of, um, of uh, Putin, um, because he simply cannot believe that people act, to, uh, that, that people uh, have uh, 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 convictions and uh, act on those convictions. He believes that uh, people can be, public opinion can be manipulated um, and, and therefore it always is manipulated. Uh, and if there is uh, uh, objections, there's somebody behind it. So, uh, and this is a threat to his regime. And so, it, so um, uh, this uh, 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 got, uh, got, into, got him into serious trouble uh, because he uh, told, as part of the deal, he told Yanukovych, you have got to uh, get rid of those people on, on the Maidan. Uh, as part of the condition of getting the next uh, two billion uh, euros released. So Yanukovych tried uh, and used force, 
And that had the opposite effect. It, instead of people running away from Maidan, they, they rushed to Maidan from every part of the country. Uh, and, and, uh, and actually, uh, Yanukovych then capitulated. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, he was put in a, 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 a sanatorium with a cold and then sent by the hardliners around him. And uh, similar to what happened to Gorbachev when he was sent to the sanatorium in, in, uh, in, in Sochi. Uh, that was the end of his regime. And uh, uh, then he was sent to Sochi uh, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, listen to Putin, who tried to uh, put some stuffing into him and told him, use live ammunition if you have to. And so he did. And that had the, the, uh, the remarkable uh, effect of uh, actually people with sticks uh, attacking the police that were firing um, at them uh, live ammunition and actually killing and wounding people and uh, just moving forward and overran the police and the police ran away. And that was the f final victory of, of, of Maidan. And it was a, a transformative event for Ukraine and that should not be underestimated. Uh, it's, it's really, you could say it's really the birth of a nation because the country is more united uh, uh, than it was before, because it was really truly divided between East and West. Uh, um, but now the uh, uh, Russian-speaking population also uh, does not want um, uh, uh, to be subjugated uh, to, uh, uh, to Russia. Uh, so he actually, his policy uh, uh, lost Ukraine for Russia. It was a, a personal uh, uh, loss um, uh, and defeat of, for uh, 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 Putin. And as a result, he cannot afford to allow uh, the new Ukraine to succeed because that would endanger uh, his position at home. So you have this implacable opposition of, of, of Putin. That's the first point. And the other point is, is that you have this uh, moment of, uh, of, of, of national unity and, 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 it, and, uh, and an assertion of uh, uh, commitment uh, to the, uh, the, the European ideal, which was uh, at the at the root of the European, uh, formation of the European Union, and which actually today doesn't really exist because the European Union uh, has been uh, transformed into uh, this uh, creditor-debtor relationship. So it's a, a tremendous opportunity for uh, uh, Europe to uh, uh, save uh, uh, um, respond uh, to the um, Ukrainian uh, the, the, uh, the desires and protect uh, uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, but it, the task is to help Ukraine rather than to punish Russia, because just punishing Russia would also be would push put push in push. Uh, put in further into a corner and and as a wounded animal he would uh, strike back and it would be a lose lose proposition so the sanctions should be there as a deterrent and not deployed uh, uh, and if they are uh, strong enough they should be uh, uh, sufficient to deter a further encroachment uh, uh, against uh, uh, Ukra Ukraine. Um, okay. uh, and uh, <coughs> um, uh, so it's, it's helping U Ukraine 
rather than hurting uh, Russia, that has to be uh, the goal. And that's a tremendous uh, opportunity for Europe uh, to, uh, uh, and, uh, to rediscover uh, <laughs> what it really stands for. Thank you very much. So maybe, hopefully, this could be a, a political momentum, create a political momentum to, to rediscover the spirit of Europe and the idea of um, Europe united and free. Yeah. Uh, I would like to, to ask Rebecca, uh, of course, for her reading what has happened over the last weeks, but then uh, in your role as an European uh, politician, uh, politician uh, there is a lot of criticism um, with respect to the European Union. Um, you know, this kind of accusation you can read in, 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 in the German media, for instance, uh, the Handelsblatt, um, we should never have go so far in offering Ukraine uh, the association uh, treaty and uh, creating an either or situation for Ukraine to decide between Russia and uh, uh, Europe. Uh, this is kind of common wisdom in parts of the, the, the German uh, public. And on the other hand, there is some criticism that we have been much too naive with respect to uh, the um, will of the, the Russian leadership and the, the uh, Putin being determined to bring Ukraine back under uh, Russian influence in, 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 the, in the Russian uh, sphere of, of, of interest. And we underestimated the, the, the conflict potential. So what do you think about it? So first of all, I completely agree that it's uh, necessary, especially uh, also in Germany, because Germany is so important for the decision-making in Brussels, it's really important to understand uh, a little bit more about Ukraine. And uh, one of the true problems I see from the very beginning uh, of this uh, crisis is uh, that uh, Germany, as uh, most of uh, the old Europe, yeah, uh, doesn't really know something about Ukraine. Uh, for me also this creates again and again problems because uh, in this situation sometimes um, as a politician it's not only good if you know too much. Yeah? You have sometimes the impression you can never bridge uh, that what you know uh, compared to uh, the people surrounding you as legislators or decision makers or uh, also in the general public. It's really uh, a challenge and um, I remember very much the decision-making on Greece, for example. And uh, Greece is a country many, many Germans know much better uh, than uh, Ukraine. Uh, but in spite of this uh, better understanding of the Greek situation, it was very difficult uh, to keep uh, the spirit of uh, European solidarity um, and uh, to keep uh, the spirit uh, of the idea, European idea, that in common well, we are uh, better uh, in uh, making the way out of the crisis. Uh, so compare the Greek challenge yeah, uh, with uh, the challenge we face now um, in what you described very well, uh, in uh, organizing uh, solidarity, help, assistance, money, etc., cetera, et cetera, uh, towards Ukraine. And uh, think about that we have to do it in this uh, incredible tension uh, which comes now, uh, not only suddenly, but for the general public, uh, very, very sudden from Russia. Um, and um, so to, to, to tell a little bit um, my view of what uh, happened in Ukraine. Um, so the, uh, and I, I would also like to speak about some mistakes uh, from uh, the European side. So um, the, the last very important mistake 
um, after we failed already in 2004 to assist the country uh, in better development. So after this um, tremendous mistake towards uh, the Yushchenko, Timoshenko um, couple, yeah, a uh, very, very problematic couple, but after this failure um, in 2009, when Mr. Yanukovych uh, was elected president, um, we did not really recognize what kind of problems this would create uh, in Ukraine. Um, and I include myself. So I, I was during uh, the weeks and months after the election always campaigning to my friends uh, in NGOs, to my friends in uh, then opposition uh, blocks in the Verkhovna Rada. I was more or less preaching, you have to learn now what it means to function as a good opposition. Also, opposition matters in a democratic country, and uh, so uh, the majority has decided in favor of uh, Mr. Yanukovych, and uh, now uh, prepare yourself uh, for tackling him in a fair, political, democratic way. And uh, I have to admit uh, that many of my friends, uh, some of them are very well known also in the German uh, political discussion um, and are representing in uh, culture, uh, are presenting their country since a long time. Um, Mr. Uh, Andruhovic is a well-known uh, uh, writer, for example. Um, he belonged to those people who from the very, very beginning said, so now we as Ukrainians have to get prepared uh, to fight um, to fight against uh, the comeback of the old time and uh, the comeback of the old thinking and the comeback of uh, Soviet Union style of uh, ruling a country. And uh, so uh, during the years, we could recognize that uh, they have been right, but we did until the very, very last moment yeah, try uh, to behave as uh, good partners also towards uh, the, um, now we say regime, during the years we said uh, government of Azarov and President uh, Yanukovych, we tried to behave as reliable partners. And um, I know that uh, many people said we could have learned uh, in Brussels earlier uh, that the idea of the association agreement and the whole idea of uh, the Eastern Partnership would not fly. But um, so this uh, whole project has been negotiated, I don't know when we started, I think in 2008, even before Yanukovych came to power, uh, even in the times uh, already of the Grand Coalition, we started to negotiate this. And uh, only, uh, I would say, during the last month, uh, there were um, now uh, loud voices, strong voices, to criticize the strategy of the European Union as such concerning association agreement and concerning the Eastern Partnership. Only since, uh, obviously, uh, Russia um, went more against uh, our ideas. And uh, I think, um, yes, uh, there might have been a mistake not to recognize Yanukovych uh, as he was already during negotiations. But in the same time, uh, there was obviously also um, a mistake uh, not to recognize uh, Mr. Putin and how he had changed uh, during uh, the long time of negotiations around uh, the ideas of uh, the Eastern Partnership. And uh, those voices from Germany always blaming the EU uh, for those uh, mistakes, um, I think uh, we are um, we, we went together yeah, for this uh, strategy. Um, nobody can tell me that we in Brussels, Mrs. Ashton, uh, Mr. Fühle, uh, the European Commission, could have negotiated since 2008 until uh, last uh, autumn the association agreement against the will uh, of uh, the governments of the member state, especially against the will of uh, German government. It would have been mission impossible. So all those who are now blaming the EU for being responsible for a wrong strategy are blaming in the same time themselves. And this is uh, one of the points, uh, I would say, where we have to learn something out of it. There is 
clearly the need yeah, to evaluate uh, those uh, strategies we follow together. But in the same time, would there be an alternative for Germany uh, to negotiate uh, with uh, the countries in uh, the eastern neighborhood uh, in the future uh, facing uh, the failure of uh, the Eastern Partnership or the Association Agreement? No. So we have to learn out, out of it and uh, uh, the EU has now to prove yeah, that uh, they are serious with their ideas still on the Eastern Partnership. Um, so one, um, one last um, um, very, very little chapter on uh, expectations in Ukraine because we should not forget about this. Um, so the Ukrainians following our discussions, they are deeply disappointed, um, especially those people who organized the new Maidan movement. Uh, I was uh, during winter 2004 very often on Maidan. I think I spent for eight weeks every weekend uh, on the Maidan. Uh, and this year, I, this winter, I was there even more often. Um, and I can judge really the differences between the two movements. Uh, the movement this time was not at all organized uh, by oligarchs or by uh, the political opposition. It was really a movement mainly coming from uh, the cities uh, of the big universities, not only in the West, but also in the East. And only um, in uh, the times of growing tensions, yeah, after the first attacks against the Euromaidan in Kiev, uh, the political opposition really get organized in this Euromaidan movement. Movement. But until the very end, until today, uh, there is um, a, a clear, um, a clearly to be distinct, uh, th there must be a distinction, and we should also see this distinction in, in between the political opposition and this new Euromaidan movement. And as Mr. Zorosh said, um, both uh, of uh, those uh, camps, uh, the Democrats uh, in uh, the uh, political uh, in the political uh, class of um, of Ukraine, but especially also this uh, young uh, and very very strong citizen movement needs now our support, our assistance. They need our money, uh, but. Uh, beyond this clear and good and dedicated assistance. They are in a tremendous challenge because all those stories told, especially from um, the old left um, uh, discussion in Germany about neo-fascists, right-wing um, right forces in this uh, movement, um, are only in parts true. Uh, the right-wing um, uh, movement is there, yeah, they have been active uh, on the Maidan, but they are, they have been so far clearly a minority. Um, I don't know what's going to happen if this movement is now altogether facing this aggression uh, via Crimea and possibly beyond. Yeah? Uh, so to avoid uh, a, a development uh, into a true uh, right-wing nationalism, an old style, uh, especially against this, uh, the engagement of the European Union in the process in Ukraine is uh, urgently needed. And uh, we, we would make a big mistake if we, in this uh, tensions we uh, have now with Russia, if we would forget about the need to organize the presidential elections, to organize parliament's elections, etc. It's really necessary and there is a big, big difference compared to, for example, countries like Afghanistan, where we also uh, very much focused on elections. In Ukraine, yeah, the people have experience with uh, democratic elections. They know why they want it. And the big difference in between 2004 and 2014, they have understood much more about our ideas of democracy and also about our ideas of the rule of law as uh, a fundament of uh, this uh, uh, differences in between uh, the old thinking from the East and uh, the thinking of the West.
Thank you very much, Rebecca. Joshka, do we have a Russian policy or do we need a new kind of policy towards Russia? Who is we? The European Union well, and especially Germany. That's a difference. Um, from my point of view, yes, the Europeans had a Russian policy. And this includes also differences, because there is no policy of the EU without certain internal differences or even frictions. But all in all, um, and I can't criticize that, um, it was the idea that Russia and the EU are neighbors in a complicated relationship, but at the end, neighbors have to live together in a peaceful way, help each other with open borders, integrate the economies. Um, I think these ideas uh, were very valuable and are very valuable. It was the idea that the Cold War is over and uh, Europe not united, but moving in the right direction, including Russia. And of course, it's great opportunity. And uh, if you think about the give and take, uh, I think uh, the opportunity is even bigger. And not only talking about the economy or uh, uh, the hard power, it's also about that 80% of the Russian people are living west of Ural. Russia has not an option to the south, there is the Islamic world. And Russia will never be an East Asian country. It's impossible, just the opposite. Uh, with China, I think the real Russian challenge will emerge. It's not uh, the return in the Cold War. So it's really a pity what we experience now because it's a huge opportunity lost. And what is the difference? The difference is that, unfortunately, those who are ruling in the Kremlin are thinking these ideas I just put together very briefly are an expression of weakness or even worse, decadence. In the Kremlin, they think still in the terms of big power politics of the 19th century. They still believe in the tools of the 20th century, as we have seen now in Crimea. And they believe that they can restore greater Russia means more or less in the framework of the Soviet Union. Not the Soviet Union, do not misinterpret my words, but bringing Russian earth together. I think the most terrible consequence will not be in Europe, but for the Russians. Because I don't believe that this will work. Why was the Soviet Union or dissembled? Was it the West? No. When the grip, the iron grip of the Communist Party were softening. It started a wave of get out of the Soviet Union by people, by minorities, who were forced during the Tsarist or the Stalinist period, or in both periods, into the Soviet Union. So for Yeltsin, this was not a moment where he was drunk when he decided together with the then Ukrainian and uh, Belarusian president in uh, uh, the Christmas time of 91 um, to dissolve the Soviet Union. The alternative was whether there will be a dissolution of the Soviet Union in chaos or in a more or less orderly form. It has started in the Baltics, but it was also happening in, uh, in uh, the Southern Caucasus area, in Central Asia, everywhere. And if you look back in the history books, the so-called national question was in the 19th century the major issue in the Tsarist uh, Russia as it was during Lenin's time and Stalin's time. And they all were right. 
it came up in 1989, 1990, 1991, and uh, I don't believe that Russia today, which has not the power, not the economic, not the political, not the military power, not the repressive power, can digest such a strategy. So what will happen if Putin would succeed and bring back the Ukraine? The trouble would be much bigger than in uh, uh, Chechnya. I don't see how this can work. But on the other side, the negative message is nobody can have an interest in a Russia which is going back into a form of disintegration and domestic troubles. So from my assessment is that at the end, um, the Russians will pay the high price for this misperception. Secondly, it's a moment for Europe. And I full-heartedly agree with George Soros, what he said, that we have now the opportunity really to fix the problems and understand that Europe is a political project. And European unification, neighborhood policy, neighborhood policy is not something for European idealists. It's the only power projection we have. This is part of our security strategy. And allow me a hypothetical question. Would have Putin acted in that way if he would have had a united Europe? At least in the core means the Eurogroup. I doubt that. Because this would be a message of strength and not of weakness. And weakness attracts trouble as we learn it now again. It's an old wisdom, but we must understand that. And therefore, I think it will be very important not to give the wrong signals. Again, I'm not in favor that we are going into a new confrontation or even Cold War. But if we try to have an approach in a more psychotherapeutic sense, so... Uh, Dear Vladimir, calm down. Now we must talk and uh, we can talk about everything. And this is the wrong message. Sorry to say so. The Europeans must be firm now. And I agree again with George. It's not about the sanctions. But I think Europe should reposition itself. Our energy dependency must be reduced. Definitely. We must also be more united. If Poland will announce tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, that it will do everything to join as soon as possible the Eurozone, this would be understood in the Kremlin as the right message. They are uniting. Unity is now very important. Unfortunately, this will hurt also the economic relations. Again, I say unfortunately. But this is not the moment to think in economic terms and forget the political consequences. Thirdly, what strikes me is the debate in Germany. I follow this debate on a daily basis. And there is one thing in common. There is we, and there is Russia, then there is a strange tribe in the Ukraine, and by the way, this debate about the right-wingers is important, but sorry, the right-wing problem is as big or even bigger in Russia than in the Ukraine. I, 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 when I see these, these rocker gang, I mean, these are good lefties, I suppose. Huh? The night wolves, dear friends of Vladimir. And all the others, I mean, do not, uh, there is a problem. I, I don't deny that. It's a question of modernization, and in such a violent process of modernization, you have, of course, strong right-wing um, groups, parties, crazies. But this is not an Ukrainian problem alone. This is at least as big in Russia or even bigger. 
But there is then this strange tribe in Ukraine. We really don't know. And then there is nothing in the German debate. What about the Poles? What about the Hungarians? What about, what about the Czechs and the Slovaks? All these three have memories about brotherly help during the Soviet time. What about the Baltics? They, are, they were victims twice and forced into Russian Soviet borders. This does not exist in our discourse. And that's a shame, allow me to say that. That's really a shame. When I see in talk shows in the TV, oh, Ukraine, it always was uh, Russian, and Crimea, it was Russian. Yeah. And nobody asks, how, sound, how, would, how is this sounding in, with the ears of Eastern Europeans, and especially the Baltics? So I think the German discourse is giving the wrong signals to Moscow. Weakness means to give the wrong signals to our allies and friends in Eastern Europe and uh, to the Russians. Last element. What Putin is pursuing is not a short-term strategy. It's a long-term strategy since his first term as president. The second half of the first term, he started to formulate that. You can see that by the instrument he has chosen. It's this time not the military, it's the energy export policy. North Stream, South Stream, these two pipelines make no sense in economic terms, much too expensive. But in strategic terms, they make a lot of sense because they should sideline the gas transport to the West, mostly to Germany, but not only, and give the opportunity to disconnect the Ukraine and put pressure on the Ukraine. Because they have learned also of the year of 2009 that uh, passing through the Ukraine means also you cannot disconnect the Ukraine without creating real trouble with the Europeans. So from that point of view, the present Russian leadership and it's a pity to say, because again, it's a lost opportunity, a great historic opportunity. The present Russian leadership wants to restore the Russian Empire, wants to restore Russia as a world power. Does that matter for the Europeans? Oh yeah, a lot. Because our whole security situation would be completely different, but even worse. This is also a conflict of principles. How will the European continent live in the 21st century together? Based on great power politics, on the use of force to change borders, or zone of influences, or will we live together based on peace, on guaranteed borders, on self-determination, and the rule of law and democracy? This is at stake, ladies and gentlemen. And therefore, from my point of view, it's a huge opportunity now. It's a crisis, but the crisis can be an opportunity. Europe must unite. Europe must overcome. And maybe someone will now understand that these crazy discussions about kicking Greece out of the Euro or of the EU would have been an invitation for Vladimir Putin. This is also a geopolitical question. Definitely a political question. And therefore, I think uh, Europe now uh, should use this opportunity, and it will strongly depend on Germany, not only. I hope that uh, the Chancellor, which I have heavily criticized um, about her European uh, uh, crisis politics, because I think she was uh, much too... Uh, a lack of courage, uh, uh, speed, uh, she had no strategy, nothing of that. Um, but I must say now, she's on a different track, I think on a very positive one. And uh, therefore, I hope that this crisis will also transform 
um, the perspective of Angela Merkel about Europe and uh, that she will grab the opportunities of European integration because this is needed. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joschka, for this big picture. Uh, George, I would like to, to come back uh, to one of your crucial uh, sayings um, uh, that it is not about punishing Russia, it's more about supporting Ukraine. And sanctions should be kind of deterrence um, towards uh, Russia and, and Putin not to go beyond Crimea, but the, the, the immediate and the most urgent um, issue would be to stabilize Ukraine politically and economically. Could you a little bit elaborate on that? What are your ideas? What are your proposals? What should we do and what could we do? It's, I'm glad to tell you that it's already happening uh, uh, because the Ukrainians themselves want it to happen and it has to be a Ukrainian-led effort because it's their country. They have to change it. And uh, they basically, uh, there are certain things that they have to do, establish uh, the rule of law, uh, uh, um, uh, bring uh, corruption uh, un under control, uh, and uh, make Ukraine a desirable um, investment destination. And there is a, a, a second uh, pillar, let's say, and that is what Europe needs to do to make it possible for them to do that. And uh, uh, given the current conditions, um, uh, uh, companies uh, would not invest in Ukraine, even if it were rule of law and uh, changed because of the threat, uh, the political threat. So uh, the first thing is, to offer political risk insurance that would indemnify uh, the companies that invest in case you have uh, the uh, further encroachment by, by by Russia. So that's one uh, one thing. Uh, then, of course, the uh, uh, the sanctions uh, could destroy. Uh, uh, undermine uh, the R Russian uh, budget and the Russian economy. But the Ukrainian uh, uh, economy is already undermined by uh, uh, the previous president, Yanukovych. Uh, and so uh, Ukraine is actually bankrupt. And it does need that 15 billion uh, uh, dollars or euros uh, that Russia was willing to put up. Uh, so, uh, and, the, uh, and with the, under the leadership of the IMF, uh, uh, that is actually, uh, can be done and it's in the process of, of being put together. But that would merely uh, stabilize the situation. You need to move forward. And, and there you need uh, also uh, technical assistance and managerial uh, assistance uh, f from from the West, uh, 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 and it it, it is a, a training of uh, of Ukrainians and the introduction of uh, uh, let's say joint ventures. You could have um, uh, European companies. Uh, making joint ventures with uh, Ukrainian companies for uh, to supply the Ukraine uh, the Ukrainian market and also up open up the uh, uh, Europe uh, the European market for Ukrainian
products, particularly those that would be produced by joint ventures. So this, this way, uh, Ukraine could be integrated into the European economy the same way as, let's say, uh, the Czech Republic is, is now very closely in integrated, uh, particularly with German industry. So, Rebecca, of course, you, you are invited to, to comment on these economic issues, but I would like to, to add another question. Um, what do you think what the new interim government in Kiev has to do and what we could do, the, the Europeans, to prevent a scenario of ethnic radicalization and conflict in, in Ukraine? Yeah, how afraid are you of that kind of uh, uh, dynamics? And what do you think what has to be done um, to put the country, to, to keep the country together and to, to, to avoid another wave of ethno-nationalism in this region? Uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the Ukraine does need to... Um, uh, Devolve, in other words, it's a very uh, diverse country, and, and uh, you need to have more delegation of powers um, um, to, uh, to the provinces, and it has to move towards, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a, f a, f a federal uh, uh, structure. However, there, there's a real danger. Uh, that this should not be uh, ad, uh, 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 imposed by Europe. There is a danger, and, and while I entirely agree with uh, Joschka that uh, 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 Chancellor Merkel is taking the right stance, I, I see a, 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 a serious danger that uh, because of the Uh, a German example of federalism and uh, her uh, determination and, and ambition to have a, a contact group uh, settle uh, the uh, outstanding issues with, uh, that uh, have emerged in the Crimea, that the whole of Ukraine would be put into that, into that uh, category and it would then be a great power uh, cabal, particularly yeah. a, a grand bargain between Germany and, and uh, Russia that uh, uh, Russia would not uh, invade uh, uh, the rest of Ukraine, uh, but uh, would uh, uh, insist on a federal structure where the police uh, would be Uh, under the uh, authority of the yeah. of the local uh, uh, states, particularly Donetsk, because Donetsk is so important for the uh, for the uh, uh, um, uh, for the Russian armaments industry is basically integrated with it. So, the, uh, 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 therefore, uh, you do that, and that would be a, ta a trap. A terrible trap, and I would say I, I, I really give uh, Angela Merkel full credit for the stance she is taking. She is more of a leader, a European leader. She has taken a, a, a greater uh, risk in leading uh, um, a, a German uh, public opinion than she has ever done before. Uh, my my main complaint about her in my book was that she's a great democratic leader uh, who can read uh, the uh, and, and listen to the public, but she's not leading. Now she's leading, and she she means well, but this is a trap that I think must be avoided. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ukraine can develop into a federal s structure, but it must be done by the, by the Ukrainians but and not mm. by a, a great power deal. But this is just why 
the Ukrainians I've been talking with, I've been in, in Kiev some, some, some days before, they are extremely critical if it comes to federalization because their fantasy, if you are talking about federalization, is not Switzerland, it is Bosnia. Yeah, it's a kind of ethnic separation and ethnic uh, division. So uh, we should be very careful with this kind of uh, terms, which uh, may sound very differently in uh, Ukraine than in, in, in Berlin. Rebecca. Um, maybe it's um, uh, important uh, to say that um, I think uh, Angela Merkel, if she really wants to lead now in this conflict, she should uh, also contribute uh, to fix the problems ab about uh, um, monetary and economic in integration. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we need some uh, it's criticism now. So it's no, no, it no yeah. it's not about this. But I see this again. There is this summit, yeah, ongoing now in Brussels. Uh, and again, yeah, they are going uh, to probably postpone major conflicts on the banking union uh, or they are doing a, a very, very weak compromise. And so my experience from uh, this last legislation is Europe is getting weaker and weaker because we are not able to fix our internal economic and uh, uh, Euro, uh, our monetary problems with the euro. And uh, so the earlier and the faster we decide, the better we will be able uh, to meet the challenges uh, surrounding up, uh, us and uh, growing during the last years. And on but, but if you, I think it's more rewarding to have a, a, a European Marshall Plan for Ukraine uh, than but anything else. And once you have it for Ukraine, you could have it for Greece as well. So, I agree. This doesn't. This doesn't mean uh, that I that I'm not convinced it's the right idea to have the Marshall Plan. I fear. I have to admit uh, that the plan for uh, Ukraine looks much more like uh, the the reform uh, program for Greece than uh, like the Marshall Plan you have in mind. But this we have, this we have to clarify still. And um, then I, so n not to, to contradict, but, uh, um, but not in contradiction, but uh, to add, because it's uh, very important. So uh, this, um, uh, this f new government has some experienced people and many people who have no experience with uh, what they are doing. Uh, the expectations towards those people uh, in the Ukrainian government are much higher than to all other existing new elected governments in Europe. I never ever before saw a situation uh, that uh, like this uh, situation, Mr. Yatsenyuk arrived in Brussels. Uh, I think it was one week after he had been elected, or 10 days, and uh, some days after the aggression on Crimea had started. First question towards him was, uh, in public, what is your reform program for your country? Uh, can you please present our uh, us the details? Uh, journalists and politicians ask this. So in, in, in Germany, so uh, in all other European countries normally before a uh, hundred days after elections and uh, start of the government, nobody would dare uh, to put such aggressive uh, questions. This gives you an impression uh, on uh, how the people, uh, with, with which attitude uh, the people are confronting uh, this uh, new uh, government of Ukraine. And sometimes uh, my feeling is in this is also a little bit the propaganda of Russia. So uh, how we judge uh, the Ukrainians uh, is always a little bit through uh, what uh, Mr. Putin uh, and Mr. Lavrov are uh, distributing as opinions uh, on Ukraine and U Ukrainian uh, politicians and this government. Uh, so to support them uh, will be very important in all those issues you, you mentioned, but 
right now, yeah, they are not only facing uh, problems on Crimea, very concrete problems like how we get our soldiers out. How can we protect the minorities on Crimea? These are um, questions which they are asked by their own citizens. What are you doing uh, for uh, our citizens, Ukrainian citizens, who, who did not want uh, to go back to Russia? Yeah? Uh, they are confronted with situations in Kharkiv or in Donetsk uh, where um, Russians, yeah, which were um, transported massively into Ukraine, are still trying uh, to, uh, to work against all public orders and are still trying uh, to develop uh, maybe the same or a similar scenario like in Crimea. Uh, before I uh, joined this discussion, latest news from Kiev uh, with pictures showed uh, crowds in Kiev uh, not from Kiev, uh, obviously from Russia or from the East or a mixture, um, and nobody knew what they are going to do. So this uh, this government has uh, that many challenges uh, that uh, I think um, we have, uh, before we decide on this, it's very important, we have also to decide on what we can do to stabilize the situation in Ukraine. And that's why we have also again and again to talk about how we help them against further aggression by Russia. And I like what you said. This sentence sounds uh, very nice for me. Um, not to punish Russia, uh, but uh, to help and to support Ukraine. But what does it mean in this concrete situation of uh, anxiety, fear, uh, and also a, a, a feeling of um, being helpless yeah, uh, against uh, what uh, Mr. Putin is doing. And therefore, uh, so I, I, I must admit, I, I, I'm getting more and more angry about discussions in Germany who blame all those who are thinking about uh, more sanctions also towards Russia uh, to achieve, uh, and this is my goal with those sanctions, to achieve a situation in which Russia comes back to the negotiation table or Russia, uh, or Russia agrees on the OSZE uh, mission to Ukraine or uh, as Mr. Mrs. Merkel wanted this uh, contact group or Russia-Ukrainian uh, uh, summit, what, whatsoever. Um, and I think uh, these uh, discussions and decisions are really necessary uh, also to stabilize the very weak, uh, but uh, from my perspective, a good government uh, in Ukraine, and also to help them against this, what could easily happen, the complete nationalization, renationalization of the conflict and what I described for me as the most awful development and I see mainly Russia responsible for this, uh, that the, again yeah, in, on this continent there is the danger, the concrete danger uh, that one nation goes to war against another nation only because the idea of that one nation is better than the other. Joska, what do you think will be the fallout of this current crisis beyond Europe? Uh, Zang, if, if we now have to, to expect a new, what are they, more conflict-like relationship uh, between uh, Russia and, and, and the West, uh, Russia no longer looking for close partnership and this kind of modernization partnership, but to establishing uh, herself as a, a um, counterpower. What will that mean for other conflict regions? I mean, if you would simplify, you can say either will Putin push back to, uh, Europe into a kind of uh, early 20, late 19th century situation, or he will be one of the founding fathers of the United States of Europe. Uh, either or. Um, I hope the second option uh, will succeed, but uh, I, th I think uh, there's a lot of trouble ahead because uh, 
Putin decided, and uh, there was an interesting article in a famous uh, uh, nationwide Bavarian daily newspaper of the uh, correspondent uh, of this uh, newspaper in Moscow two days ago, where he was, uh, the thesis was that this Putin have made also domestic decisions, mm -hmm. that um, uh, liberalism is gone, a new authoritarian drive uh, will take over, not only in the society and in politics, but also in the economy. Um, if this would be true, I think uh, these consequences uh, would be also uh, dramatic, uh, first of all, for the Russians, but uh, also this will have also will be mirrored uh, in, uh, in foreign policy too. Um, I'm in the short term uh, expect uh, more trouble in the Ukraine because uh, a success of the Ukraine, a democratic success, would have immediate ramifications in Russia. Uh, it would threaten the system. Therefore, it, won't be, it will not be allowed. Very simple. It's hard to achieve, but it will not be allowed. So destabilization strategies will be the answer. And uh, this is also risky for Europe, for Russia, for the direct neighbors. Some of them are uh, members of the European Union and of NATO. Um, but uh, a chaos perspective uh, in, in the Ukraine is, uh, is a, a serious option. And therefore, I think, uh, the interest of Europe must be, and not only Europe, of the West, America included, must be to stabilize the situation. It's, it will be not easy. But what we have to realize, Mr. Putin obviously is not impressed by balanced budgets. That is a matter of fact. Huh? So we have to really, I mean, um, try to use the strength of the West. And this is not only money, but money is needed. As you said, they are de facto bankrupt, so they must be stabilized. But elections are ahead, and this might be a very troublesome period um, based on the interests of the other side. So, um, but I think we have also strong political tools. Visa free traveling is a big issue in Russia and in the Ukraine and in Belarus, everywhere. So I think if the EU will use that tool in a clever and wise way. Um, yeah, but it's stupid. It's very, you shouldn't give up. I mean, it, by and then, it needs time. Uh, I would insist on that, because uh, as more of the young people are coming over, I think uh, as stronger the case will be at the end. Uh, therefore, this is only one element uh, uh, I think uh, we could use. And again, uh, I think sanctions are less important because sanctions, the approach of sanctions is you do what we want or we punish you. So if you are doing that in a very serious way, as it was done with Iran, it worked. But visa bans for 20 guys is not really impressive, believe me, um, based on my experience. So I think it's more important that the Europeans now doing their homework for themselves. It's up to us whether we reduce our energy dependency. And this is an extremely strong signal for Russia because the Russian budget depends directly from a certain level of the oil price. There are other um, elements politically. As more as Europe is giving strong political uniting messages, as more they will be taken serious in Moscow. And as more we try to be polite people, as more we are not taken serious. It's a matter of fact. I regret that, but it's a matter of fact. So uh, from that point of view, 
there is a lot of trouble ahead, and it, this needs really a strong commitment for political and economic uh, um, support uh, for the Ukraine. Uh, but uh, we must also make quite clear, we are doing that not in the understanding that the EU is a big power because we want the Ukraine to be part of and we want uh, to move ahead with uh, NATO enlargement or whatever. That's not the intention. Our intention is that the people in Europe should decide about their own destiny and not a big power. That's the principle and therefore if we move ahead, I think we can really succeed, but this is not a short-term crisis. This will be a longer-term crisis, or let me say, confrontation. There will be a new containment. It's not the Cold War. It's not a thermonuclear arms race. It's not uh, two systems fighting against each other. It will be happen mostly in the field of economy and politics. But it will be a kind of containment, or we will accept a policy where we think this policy is completely wrong. I think... <laughs> if you are if you're right, Joska, there is emerging a very serious question. What will that mean for civil society in Russia? And I think about the democratic part of civil society in Russia, not the right wing nationalist uh, part. So we have seen last Sunday I think a very surprising and encouraging demonstration of about 50,000 people in Moscow against the war, against the, the intervention. But at the same time, I agree very much that there is kind of interconnectivity, there is an inner relationship between aggression towards Ukraine and this kind of uh, going back to old-fashioned power politics and stiffening the authoritarian rule within Russia domestically. So democratic civil society in Russia will come even more under pressure than it has been the case in the last years and you can see it now uh, in, the, in the media sphere, the, the last independent TV channel now is uh, 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 shut down, uh, uh, internet uh, website, critical uh, internet websites are censored. So I think we, we have to, to, to be very aware that there will be a critical period for Russian civil society too and, have to, and, and we, we must do all what we can to support them and to keep contact. Yeah, and, and and to differ between the the regime and the I would say parts of the 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 Russian society which don't want to live under such circumstances, they want to have a decent life under democratic uh, circumstances, and they want to have opportunities for them and their their children. There is a potential. Um, and I think this is a role of all of us who are not in the government who are part of civil society, of the NGO community, to reach out to the, the Russian civil society and to, to support them in the hard times to come. Um, uh, uh, actually, the situation is even more dire uh, because uh, 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 Putin is now appealing to Russian ethnic nationalism it was pointed out to me by my uh, uh, advisors and uh, the f foundation that uh, uh, he's talking about Ruski, not Rossiski. And uh, that is an appeal to Russian ethnic. Now, within the, and it's of course totally uh, contradictory to the, his ambition of re, re instituting the Russian Empire because. It's got a lot of pe uh, different nationalities within it. And within the remaining Russia, uh, uh, nearly half uh, uh, the population is, is, is non, in fact, more than half the population is non-Russian. Non, non and, hmm? 
Yeah, and it's growing faster, and the Russian population is declining because of the birth uh, rate. Um, and and uh, um, that's a direct threat to them. You know, all the Caucasians in Moscow and, and all the uh, migrant workers from um, other parts of, uh, from Tajikistan as well. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a real threat and it's, it's again, self-defeating. But I, uh, while I fully agree with uh, the positions you, you have uh, espoused, uh, um, I think uh, we have to talk a little bit more about sm smart sanctions. Because smart sanctions are the sanctions that you don't deploy because they are deterrent. And I think we do have smart sanctions. And it remains to be seen whether they'll deter uh, uh, Putin from doing what, uh, you know, now he's uh, uh, cornered, uh, he's kind of pushed into doing. But there are still, um, even though it's a, a personal dictatorship, uh, uh, there are other institutional forces uh, that have a say in, 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 in Russian policy. And these smart sanctions, uh, um, uh, even though Putin doesn't care about balanced budgets, uh, nevertheless, if you if you have a budget deficit and you can't cover it, uh, it has dire consequences. So, what do and you have in mind if you're talking about smart sanctions? Well, that's uh, that's very important. That to, to uh, the, the uh, probably the s strongest sanction is in the hands of of, of the United States, namely to re release uh, oil from the. Uh, uh, petroleum reserves, strategic reserves, and sell it uh, on the international market. Uh, and that would be uh, s sufficient to depress the price of oil. Uh, uh, and Russia needs a, uh, uh, oil at $100 or more for the ba yeah, for balanced budget. So that's, number, that's the biggest. And actually, uh, uh, right now, uh, America has two years, uh, uh, reserves for three years. It needs reserves for one year, and because of the uh, rise in shale oil, you have two extra years. So selling it is, no, is, is, is not painful for, for the United States. It would have uh, other effects as well. Actually, it would be quite beneficial for the global economy, <laughs> offsetting the uh, offsetting the negative effects of these troubles. Uh, it would it would actually uh, also uh, be quite uh, um, uh, uh, would affect Iran, uh, and therefore, it's unlikely that uh, that uh, Saudi Arabia would make up for the reduction for the sale. Uh, because Saudi Arabia uh, uh, is in uh, uh, conflict with Iran. So it, it's, it, it, that's a very powerful one. But the, the really powerful and the smart sanctions are not to prevent, to freeze foreign accounts and, and prevent uh, or forbid foreign travel. That's a, that's a symbolic... Uh, 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 sanction that had to be imposed uh, to demonstrate that uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, merger of uh, of of, of uh, uh, Crimea was done in violation of international uh, uh, law and in in the violation of the Budapest Memor Memorandum of 1994. So. You had to impose them, but they are symbolic. The real smart sanctions is to to slow down or uh, 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 arrest the inflow of money, because uh, the, the, 
the oligarchs, since they don't trust the uh, rule of law in Russia, uh, are in the habit of sending their children and their, their profits abroad. Then, if they need it, they bring it back in the form of loans. Uh, so, uh, the, the uh, R Russian industry is hollowed out. It has no capital. It, 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 it has, it's leveraged up with, with uh, uh, bank loans. And the foreign direct investment is also, a lot of it is just uh, Russian money coming back uh, in a different way. So you stop that and, and then the, the uh, Russian economy is, is destroyed. Now, you don't want to, again, you don't want to do that and you should apply it only uh, uh, very judiciously and if uh, Russia makes a small move, then you also make a small move. But every move by Russia to squeeze uh, uh, Ukraine, or for instance, uh, to try to annex Transnistria, because we haven't talked about that, but that's a very uh, serious uh, threat, um, should be uh, 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 reciprocated by a counter move. I'm not sure uh, whether I'm always close enough to the German discussion in the last weeks, um, especially also not on this discussion on uh, sanctions. Because um, so also in your concept, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's um, kind of escalation. And uh, the further you go, the more those sanctions are requiring change, at least change yeah, in our uh, EU societies. And um, I remember <laughs> how difficult it, it is already uh, in the economic crisis uh, to uh, organize um, solidarity um, and uh, to uh, get uh, readiness uh, not only to help Greece, but uh, to stabilize uh, EU as such and to help uh, by certain uh, measures also ourselves. And um, my, my feeling uh, towards uh, the discussion we are facing in Germany is um, th they are um, on the one hand uh, in Germany refusing sanctions uh, because it might hurt uh, Putin more and it might uh, so uh, get uh, the results we, we don't want. It might uh, escalate uh, the aggression. Yeah? But on the other hand, behind this, uh, my impression is that there is also a deep concern on this necessary change. And um, I had in many discussions uh, across Europe uh, in the last weeks, I had the impression that uh, the more I go east, uh, the more the people share the feelings and the anxiety, the fears uh, with the Ukrainians and feel themselves under a little bit uh, of attack. Yeah? But the more you go west, uh, the more uh, distance uh, the people have towards what, to what, uh, what's going on uh, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. And this uh, results directly in this attitude uh, that uh, there uh, might be a clear um, solution without easy solution, without sanctions and without any change in the relation of, uh, in, in the re relation in between uh, Germany or EU and Russia. And I think, so from my point of view, this has to be tackled. Yeah? Um, so it's not about uh, being aggressive uh, against uh, Russia, but it's really again and again about the question, how can we achieve what Joschka has said? How can we make sure that Ukrainians can decide uh, on the future of their country on their own? Yeah. You are too pessimistic. Because there is the factor Putin. You would be right if Vladimir Putin would transform into a Green Party member and a pacifist. Then you, you would be right. Because then, uh, yeah, 
he would be satisfied with uh, Crimea and uh, that's it. But nobody believes that. Yeah. Definitely nobody believes that. So it's not a question whether we, quote unquote, escalate. The question will be what will Moscow yeah, but do? Yeah, but what I, I'm saying you are too pessimistic because the dynamic factor will be on the other side. And the leaders of the democratic elected leaders of the West and of Europe, of the EU, will be forced into uh, uh, this situation uh, because uh, it, it will not end with, uh, 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 with this now state, new status quo. Mm -hmm. It will go forward, it will go ahead. Um, and uh, they either can accept it, which they won't do, even in Germany, the mood will slowly but steadily switch. Um, it's this crazy idea about NATO enlargement. Nobody, nobody, nobody is asking, should we have said to the Poles, yeah. you are not coming in. I mean, it's completely mad. And there are reasons why the Poles wanted to get of into course. NATO. Never again in the, on the wrong side uh, of history. And Poland was betrayed twice. The West started the Second World War because Nazi Germany, we, attacked Poland. And at the end of the Second World War, Poland was again, I mean, uh, put on the wrong side by the occupation of uh, Poland by the Soviet army. So we should say, we should have said to them, no, to NATO, impossible. To the Baltics, no. To the Czechs and Slovaks, to the Hungarians, we should have said no, because this would have been a provocation for Russia. This can't be a serious argument, ladies and gentlemen. Therefore, I'm pretty optimistic that the dynamic started by uh, the Kremlin uh, will push our public opinions and our leaders in a more, um, in a stronger uh, standing. Uh, wouldn't be uh, so, so pessimistic. Okay, I, I, I remember your successor um, Mr. Steinmeier, the foreign minister, saying, and he for sure, he doesn't want escalation. He doesn't want confrontation. But I, but I remember him. No, I no, 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 no. Yes, I don't, I let, just, just let finish me. I remember him saying, and he was said about that, there will be no way back to business as usual. Yeah, I'm confirming what you have been, been, been saying. There will be no way back to, to business as usual. And we regret that to a, a certain extent, but we have to acknowledge uh, the new challenge and the, the, a, a different strategic situation. But the problem is that up to now, Putin was always at least one step beyond. And we ahead. At least one step ahead, and we only had been in the reaction models. So there was no forward looking strategy. What we can learn out of history is democracies are slow. Because every, it must be discussed. It must be, I mean, it's, uh, I can't remember a democratic reaction uh, compared to an authoritarian regime where a democracy was acting promptly. It needs time. It needs, I mean, look for businessmen. They made good business with Russia in good confidence that this is, will improve uh, the situation and the connections will be improved. And suddenly they should say, oh, these were not so good investments and they should write off some of these investments or go ahead in a very troublesome future. It needs time. It's not that someone in the chancellery is grabbing the phone and telling them, now folks, it's game over, now is another game. This is not uh, uh, the way democracies work. The public opinion is a process of discussion, of readjustment, but I wouldn't underestimate democracies. They are moving slowly,
but decisively. That's the lesson of history we had. Let me be a little more optimistic than you are, because, <laughs> uh, because, because uh, you, you expect that, that this downward spiral will actually get uh, um, um, uh, Europe uh, more united. Uh, I think there's also the possibility that the world is sufficiently united already, that, that for instance, uh, China abstained, did not support uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Russia in the Security, uh, Security Council. It was 14 against one. So, and when you listen to, uh, at least yesterday, when you listen to Putin, he was under defensive already. He, he was trying to justify uh, uh, what he was doing uh, 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 rather than laying the groundwork for further aggression, except for one, there was one statement that was suspicious. When he spoke, spoke about the Ukrainians and the Russians being one, one, uh, one people, uh, that was the one thing that would justify, you know, uh, uh, moving further. But for the rest, he was... Uh, there is another. Uh, I mean, it was seen, especially in Germany, as very positive. Putin said, I'm not interested in dividing the Ukraine. We don't need it. We, we, yeah. I, I, I have a very different uh, perception. It was the clear message that, no, we won't divide the Ukraine. We are interested in the whole of Ukraine. This was... Uh, but, but at the same time, at the same yeah. time, he has really united uh, Ukraine in opposition, uh, because the East is now uh, under the Russian, uh, ethnic Russian, the Ruskies in, 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 uh, in uh, Ukraine, uh, don't want to be uh, part of Russia. George, for me, Some for me the consequence, one sentence, for me the consequence is Putin, maybe there will be now a kind of moderation, but before the elections, I think trouble will start again. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my, my view is that he cannot allow a stable development in the Ukraine. That's my maybe too dire uh, uh, assessment, but he cannot allow and will not allow that. And therefore, I'm maybe more pessimistic than you are. Rebecca? So um, the, during the last days, if you could uh, follow... Um, Oh, I, I could follow uh, because of some contacts uh, relatively closely what happened in, in Crimea. And uh, I um, share completely the perception of Mr. Steinmeier that it was a kind of miracle uh, that there have not so far, toy, 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 not more people, um, have not more people been killed. Uh, because um, it was only due in the very last uh, uh, hours uh, and the very last uh, day, uh, days after the, the referendum, it was only due to the calm mood uh, of uh, the Ukrainian soldiers that nothing happened. Because uh, the aggression uh, by the Russian troops uh, was already very, very tough. And uh, so, to be honest, uh, we... Uh, from from uh, our stage here, we can be calm and optimistic. Uh, some of uh, our friends in Ukraine are not yet uh, optimistic. And um, there is also one thing which came into my mind uh, when uh, you talked about Ruski, Rus, etc. So the, the perception in Ukraine of uh, the very fast decision that uh, in the West that, okay, Crimea is gone. It's, it's a symbol. Um, so let's uh, be Crimea with uh, Russia um, and then uh, the problems are over. Uh, this um, very fast uh, decision or a very clear attitude uh, in the West uh, was not shared uh, and not understood because 
so in in Kiev, yeah, uh, they fear uh, that uh, the old uh, historic uh, borders uh, will be uh, the fundament of the new concept of Mr. Putin for Ukraine, and um, so this um, this um, ongoing uh, fear and this ongoing um, situation of being in danger with the own ideas. Um, we 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 should have it in mind, and maybe uh, Ralf, it would be good, yeah, not uh, to have this discussion only here in Berlin, uh, but uh, to move uh, with those discussions also to Kiev uh, and to Moscow. Um, what I understood uh, from the panels we had in Leipzig during uh, the the fair, uh, the, the Leipziger Buchmesse last weekend, panels with Russians and with Ukrainians is. Uh, that uh, especially in in Russia, uh, the citizens' movement, uh, Memorial, and others, they are extremely interested in uh, learning the truth about what's going on uh, in in Ukraine, and their hope, yeah, the citizens' movement's hope in Russia, is very much focused now on uh, Ukraine. Uh, they explicitly said, several uh, people from Russia said in Leipzig. Uh, if uh, you make Ukrainian democratic development with the help of EU a success, then we will make yeah. it also. I agree. The, uh, Memorial, the, the, f the famous Russian human rights organization, also has branches in eastern Ukraine, in Donetsk and, and uh, Kharkiv. Uh, and we will uh, do our best to, to support now Russian-Ukrainian dialogue on the civil society level. It's extremely important to have Russian-Ukrainian voices heard in Russia. Uh, so ethnic Russians or Russian-speaking sp uh, Ukrainian citizens who want to be Ukrainian citizens and who don't ask for brotherly help from, from, from Moscow. And uh, the other way around, it's extremely important to have democratic voices from Russia in, 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 in Ukraine. Yeah. So to, to try to, to, to prevent this kind of yeah, ethno-nationalist radicalization, which is a, a, a real uh, danger. And we have seen in, in former Yugoslavia how fast, how fast neighbors can be turned into enemies. Yeah, and, and, and this would really be catastrophic, not only for, for Ukraine. This is uh, extremely explosive for the whole of uh, Eastern and, and, and Southeastern Europe. Any comments on that? No? <laughs> Okay, uh, we have to we have to to finish. But if there are some really urgent uh, uh, desire for 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 questions, uh, we should make it possible. But but uh, please, we are three hundred uh, fifty people. I only can take maybe three or four, and then we have to close here. Where's the mic? Ute, einfach just backwards. There has been, and then the lady. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, one short question. We started this discussion with the link between the economic and uh, monetary policy and the foreign policy. And I think it's a very good question. And I would like to highlight this link because I believe some people on Maidan were there for the values. But other people in eastern Ukraine and uh, Krim are there because they do not necess necessarily associate uh, democracy with um, prosperity. Many, for many, it's, they associate stability uh, uh, that represents Russia with uh, economic wealth. So I was, would like to ask you, don't we have a case to prove that um, we are more capable and better capable to produce also wealth in uh, Ukraine and Russia to these people that... Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. And the lady? Yep. Yes, um, it's clear that there's divide and conquer policy between transatlantic region represented by United States and EU versus uh, Eurasian, you know, Eurasian uh, nations represented by Russia and China. But there, there, I think there is a, a third factor in this that is often not mentioned, which is driving this confrontational policy to the brink of thermonuclear war, which is in 
financial system, the, the international financial empire, so to speak, they are sitting on top of 1.4 quadrillion deliberative bubbles. And as Mr. Soros probably know, they're using uh, organizations in Ukraine, like uh, the Renaissance Foundation and so forth, oh. to really uh, uh, push for radical regime change in Ukraine and forcing country like Germany to support this Nazi coup. And this is done also from economic manipulation okay. and using puppet, probably personal puppet of George Soros, Mr. Soros, Obama is being used as a sort of like a finger on the red button. Okay, we got and it. This has to be stopped. Okay, and we got it. We country, are part of a conspiracy here. have to here. be united in overthrowing that international casino finance, not any government so, in thank the you. world, in it's, Russia it's okay. or China. Thank the you. real enemy is sitting Please right in front of us. Finish, okay. So, are there other voices? Um, maybe... Uh, I, bel I believe this could be a more rational voice. Uh, Europe had about 25 years after the Berlin War to develop a coherent geopolitical strategy for Russia and Ukraine. The events that are folding show a monu monumental failure because we have reached uh, to this extent by a lot of inconsistent strategies. My question to George Soros is, what should be the appropriate geopolitical strategy for the European Union to bring Russia closer, and according to a lot of uh, political analysts, not to push them towards China? And the question to Joska Fischer is, when will the high time for Germany to take its responsibilities on geopolitical level and to start exercising uh, its real responsible role. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Jan, yeah. Um, in, the, um, in the talk, uh, in the speech Putin gave, uh, the last famous one, um, he used this picture uh, of a spring that's uh, compressed and snaps back hard, I think. Do uh, you have any empathy or understanding, at least, for Russia or Putin feeling compressed? Okay. And the last, the very last, uh, yeah, at, at the very back, at the left side. Thank you. Um, you talked about rather dubious sanctions as consequences for Russia, but could you make it a little more plastic so that we actually realize what could happen to Russia if it really takes Kharkov and Donetsk and maybe Kiev? <laughs> Thank you. So, final round. Will you start, George, please? There were, had been several questions addressing you. Yeah. Uh, 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 let me try backwards because I uh, probably forget the others. Uh, uh, um, um, uh, the uh, already forgotten. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the sp feeling the spring uh, uh, right now. Uh, uh, Russia has, I mean, Putin has uh, reached the maximum that you could get out of Russian uh, nationalism with, with, uh, with uh, the reunification of uh, Crimea uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, Russia. And uh, using reunification was particularly addressed to the German public to get German sympathy. Uh, uh, as he continues, uh, encroaching further and further on Ukraine, uh, the resistance and at the same time uh, the sanctions uh, begin to bite uh, uh, in, in, in Russia. Uh, the Russian population will cease to be so ethnically uh, 
uh, uh, engaged. So uh, right now he, he released that that uh, thing, and it's it's it, as as it's released, and as he if he con if he continues uh, in, in encroaching and and uh, ag uh, with aggression, uh, 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 that feeling will uh, turn against him. Uh, so that's that would be my reaction uh, to that. Um, uh, on uh, on the second, uh, on the, uh, uh, what to do? What kind of strategy? The important thing is to recognize that the interests of Putin are not identical with the interests of Russia, and that has to be an important factor in. Uh, uh, in our in our strategy, and it, it is already uh, uh, paid, you can criticize Putin's policies, uh, particularly in, in establishing or uh, trying to establish the Russian Empire as as a rival of the European Union. As uh, uh, it can you can criticize it on patriotic grounds. And that is that was already happening. Now those voices are suppressed through uh, brutal suppression. Uh, 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 but uh, but uh, that is uh, eventually, uh, I think, uh, will come uh, to to the fore. It's a question of how long it will take. It, it may take a very long time, or it could happen uh, sooner. Uh, the more you have, uh, um, you mo the more uh, Putin moves towards war and aggression, the sooner it's going to happen, but the more uh, painful it's going to be. Um, and there was a question about prosperity and, and, and democracy, and it's cl it's clear that uh, for the current uh, wave of uh, um, uh, of uh, feelings for reform in Ukraine need to be reinforced for 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 the uh, momentum to be in Ukraine which is a very positive momentum, uh, are maintained. And that is where uh, Europe has to uh, f uh, uh, aim at uh, helping Ukraine and having the sanctions in reserve in case the co Russian uh, aggression continues. And that's a about uh. yeah, so on on Russia uh, also I myself I made a huge mistake I I'm used to listen since years uh, to international programs be it CNN sometimes Al Jazeera it depends a little bit also on what happens on the world uh, but um, I never ever <laughs> uh, followed um, Russia today and some weeks ago, uh, I think uh, after New Year's Eve uh, in, in Kiev, I started to follow Russia today. And um, I think uh, it was one of the most challenging um, uh, experiences because I couldn't stand it. Yeah? I, I had for a very long time, I had not uh, listened to a program uh, which was so uh, aggressive uh, on uh, national um, interests and uh, nationalisms uh, as uh, this uh, program of Russia today. And uh, I think um, so uh, this um, Russia of Mr. Putin um, is economically still very weak. We saw it also uh, during uh, the last weeks when uh, uh, so uh, the development uh, of uh, um, uh, on, on the stock markets uh, we are uh, not so good as uh, some days ago uh, because of Crimea and uh, the big oil and gas reserves Russia gained by the way or Gazprom gained by the way with Crimea. So before 
the, you could see uh, how the ruble and the stock markets went down. And uh, obviously, um, this uh, propaganda of uh, Putin uh, to um, bring uh, the Russians back to the feeling of old strengths uh, has very much to do with uh, that he was also not able to reform uh, the country and to reform also the economy. So this is uh, also uh, something uh, which makes clear uh, that in this uh, interdependent uh, Europe where uh, Putin uh, depends on us and uh, our money and we depend on his uh, uh, gas and uh, oil reserves, we have some possibilities uh, to achieve something to have certain impact on what he is doing uh, in Ukraine and maybe in other places. Because you mentioned Transnistria, we have not discussed this, but the next aggression could also happen in, in Transnistria. The Russians there have already invited uh, the, uh, the, um, the Russians, uh, the, the troops of Russia, uh, to help them as they did it uh, already uh, on Crimea. Uh, so, um, in this context of uh, the, the, the mood in Russia, um, I think um, we should be prepared, yeah? um, not, as you say, uh, to, not to punish them, uh, but to make clear if they want to follow this way of isolation, they will be, in the end, uh, in isolation, and there will be a price to be paid. Uh, on, on Ukraine, uh, nobody, really nobody right now in Ukraine is uh, answering the question uh, you have asked. Uh, I have a very good uh, friend in Kharkiv. I met him last week also in Leipzig and during a panel discussion he was asked, uh, Serhi, uh, with uh, which kind of feelings are you preparing uh, traveling back to Ukraine? Um, and he said, um, I have no idea whether I will really be able to travel back to my hometown. Uh, we have to see from day to day uh, whether uh, our hometowns are still uh, places where we can go or whether Russia is going there. Kharkiv is only 30 kilometers away from the Russian border and uh, many, many people in Kharkiv think uh, this will be uh, the next place uh, where uh, Russia is uh, going uh, to uh, yeah, um, rebuild uh, uh, the old territory. So, and also for this situation, I can only repeat, we have to be prepared, we must ready as Europeans uh, for certain change, uh, especially in uh, our uh, energy strategies. This is helpful anyway for a better uh, long-term uh, strategy around, uh, around energy. And um, for me, very much in the center of this discussion is also whether the Germans and the Europeans, not only in the East, uh, are um, able to redefine now their European project. Because it's, um, it's uh, I think, um, a, a very, very important situation where you have really to think about whether this uh, uh, fatigue on Europe, ja, diese Europamüdigkeit, diese Frage, brauchen wir das alles wirklich und ist es nicht ein bisschen zu viel und äh, muss man da nicht ein bisschen wieder Kompetenzen zurückholen, äh, wo es so, it's so, so clear uh, that all those uh, strange uh, discussions in the challenge of this situation are odd, yeah, are ugly, are from yesterday. Uh, we will manage this situation either as Europeans together or not. Yeah, I think uh, Rebecca is, uh, is, is very right. Uh, um, it will be really, I mean, uh, an interesting experience uh, to see the ongoing debate in the UK about exit uh, in the present situation. Yeah. Or remember, especially the younger generation here in the room, uh, many of your generation are saying, well, uh, when Helmut Kohl or Helmut Schmidt, these uh, great grandfathers were talking about Europe is the greatest uh, peace project in, uh, uh, the EU is the greatest peace project in history, the reaction, oh, come on, I mean, that's, 
That's from yesterday or, or day before yesterday. Now suddenly it's back. And Europe, uh, therefore, I think it's a great opportunity. Suddenly the self-explaining Europe is back. It was lost. If you, it will be an interesting election campaign. And uh, I would give up now. I would give up now. It's the first time when there is really a political opportunity. It's an uphill battle, but I think it's a really an opportunity. Secondly, the question, I have no empathy. I have a lot of empathy for Russia, the Russians, but not for Russian nationalism. By the way, I have no empathy for any kind of nationalism, not only the Russian, and definitely not for Vladimir Putin. So from that point of view, whether he think now he feels the spring or whatever, I don't know. But I think autumn will arrive very soon. <laughs> and uh, the, question, the question about German leadership is the wrong question, sorry to say so. Europe will not be led by one nation. Europe can be only led by France and Germany, but never by France alone or Germany alone. Because the very construction of the European project rests on these two nations. That's not exclusive, that's inclusive. It does not mean that it will work if the two nations agree, which is complicated. But if they don't agree, that's a given, nothing positive can happen. So it, I think it's a wrong question uh, Germany will play a very important role in uh, uh, the European Union. And you are right, from a Greek perspective, Germany has blocked a lot, but not so much as some of our Greek friends think. That this discussion couldn't happen in a common framework is the problem from my point of view. Um, so um, I think uh, it's, it's what we see now, as George mentioned it, is a different Angela Merkel. And she will be in the office for the next years, um, definitely. And uh, I think this might change also her perception about the importance of Europe. At least, that's my hope. And from that point of view, this can be a real game changer also for the broader project of uh, European political integration, at least in the Eurogroup. But it cannot be done by Germany alone. I think this is more a problem than a solution. Uh, and by the way, the Germans don't know how to do it. Uh, we should be honest. Uh, and this is not, uh, I'm, 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 I do not blame uh, my countrymen and women for uh, that deficit. It has a lot to do with our history and the presence of our history, which is a good thing. Um, allow me to say that as a German. And uh, from that point of view, I think it must be a common effort. Also in essence, there must be a new thinking. Yeah. Everybody must have this new approach and thinking. Uh, because Europe is a common um, historical um, development uh, and not uh, led by uh, the dominance of one nation. Therefore, sorry to say that, I think the question is not the right one. Thank you very much. Okay. So, oh, yeah. Uh, one, one sentence to the young lady. As I was as young as you, I remember the first time that I had to confrontation in Frankfurt University with the, the followers of Helga Zeplarusch. Hmm. And since then, at that time, it was the European Labour Party, not Buzo. And there are many transformations. Yeah, but, but what, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. What I want to tell you, what I want to tell you, look, I'm now 66. And the ideas you are well, trying you to promote when I'm are not really flourishing. So maybe you can reconsider whether your engagement, which I value really, um, is not wasted in the present organization you are active in, 
and whether it wouldn't be a good idea to reconsider your position. Okay. So, we leave it with that positive note on the not, not not the not this kind of fuzzy organization no but the opportunity which lies in the current crisis to rediscover europe the european project as a political project and as a value based project a community of of, of values um i think it was there was a lot of food for thought uh, and we will continue this discussion in our annual foreign policy conference, which will deal just with that question, the new international role and responsibility of the European Union and of Germany within the European Union. And I think one of the most puzzling questions will be how to deal with a power like Russia, which is acting like a very old-fashioned power at the beginning of the 20th century, without falling back ourselves in these kind of political patterns. So if we want to avoid this kind of appeasement attitude, so avoid conflict at any price, what is the alternative? Not confrontation at any price, but we have to look, I would say, for an intelligent third way in our foreign policy. So, and I hope that this kind of discussion, we need really serious foreign policy debate again. Not in a societal, not in a societal sense, but there have to be alternatives between, I would say, Cold War and avoiding conflict at any price. And so I think this evening was a little step forward and we will continue and invite you to follow. Thank you very much.